All right, tonight I want to talk to you about the inner altar of your soul. And we began this series last week, and over the next several weeks, it's my hope that we're going to continue on in our study of God's glory. Amen? Amen. And we're going to conclude this series by talking about the vision of the temple, of the third temple that, that Ezekiel saw in his prophecy. Amen? Amen. So, the, and I want specifically tonight, I want to speak about the altar of your soul. And God, God longs for His glory to dwell among you, and to dwell within you, and to be upon you. God's glory is His presence. His presence is called the Shekinah in Hebrew. Yeah. And last week, we described how God longs to dwell in your midst, and that the temple is God's connection to you. Amen? In Exodus 25, 8, and if you follow along in your scriptures with me, Exodus 25, verse 8 says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Amen? You notice how it says, it says, make me, God is saying to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. God is not requesting that a temple be built that he may dwell in the temple. He's saying, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So the purpose of the temple is that His glory may dwell in you. Amen? Amen? The structure is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you become the, the habitation for the Spirit of God. Amen? Because every one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God longs to dwell inside of you. Amen? Amen. And we need to learn how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You know, as we're, uh, this evening we're listening to, to Catherine Coleman, listening to one of her teachings from 1972 at ORU, and she was really talking about being in communication and re really uh, being one with the Spirit of God, amen? That you learn how to follow His leading, and you learn how to submit to Him. We live in a generation that doesn't know this. We live in a generation that, that does not long for His presence. I remember in the 80s and the 90s, you hear messages about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And these ministers, ministers that gave these kind of teachings would have their services pack out. But if I were to give a sermon today called Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, nobody would show up. Because this generation is so different, isn't it? And there isn't a, and it's not their fault. I, I just don't know what, I don't know what happened. I don't know what was missed. But you know, there isn't a longing for the Holy Spirit in this generation. And it's my prayer that communion with the Holy Spirit will return back to the body of Christ. Yeah, Amen? Because yeah. what did Jesus say before he ascended to heaven? He told, he told him to tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Amen? Yeah. And there are many that seek the presence of God only because they want to see the spectacular. They want to see the manifestation of the, of the Holy Spirit's power gifts. Yeah. But how many of us want to know the Holy Spirit so that we can fellowship with Him? and commune with Him, and to be intimate with Him. Amen? Because I'm telling you, what's more important to me, and it's my request that all of you will enter into the same, in the same mindset, is that you don't want to be with the Holy Spirit just for His gifts. You want to be with Him mainly because you love Him, you want to fellowship with Him, and you really want to have communion with God. Amen. You know, I've heard so many people say, they don't believe in religion, and they say they're, they're spiritual. And they speak about the universe like it's a spirit being. Yeah. But, they, but there's no, they're, they're, to me that's empty. Because God, I mean, if we have personalities, if we have emotions, how much more should our Creator have? Because how can God, if God has no emotion, has no, has no um, intellect, has no attributes, no emotions, what, how can He create a creature that has more than what He has? So if we have emotions, the Creator has even more emotion. Amen? Yes. And, I'm, and, I, and I, I want us all to, I pray that the Holy Spirit will give us all that revelation that He is God. Amen? Because mm -hmm. before, before Jesus ascended to heaven, He told the disciples, the, the apostles, to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power. And He also told them before the crucifixion that, they would, that He would send them another comforter or helper. And the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost and He has been with us for 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. And when the rapture takes place, the Spirit of God will be caught up as well. Amen? Yeah. And so and this dispensation of grace for the Gentiles will come to an end. 
and then it will be the time of the, of the Jews and, 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 all the, and all the Jews will, will come in. Amen? And so uh, what I want you to do is to enter into intimacy with the Holy Spirit. If you study all the patriarchs in the Bible, the matriarchs, the patriarchs being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, and you study all the prophets like M M Moses, Elijah, El Elisha, or Elisha as we say, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, they all had an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The prophet Jonah, or Jonah as we say, had an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, when Jonah ran from God, he knew what he was doing. And when God called him back, he came back. Amen? And all of us need to have that relationship with God that when, we, when we're distant from him, we're sensitive enough to hear his summons back to him. Amen? Because we all, from time to time, will run away from God or hide from his presence. Mankind has been doing it since the time of the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve hid from God's presence. But my goal in this teaching series is to cause all of us to return back to fellowship with God. That we all want to be intimate with Him. Amen? We all want to be with Him. And I encourage all of you above your careers, above your ministry aspirations, beyond all that you want to do, is to let this year of 5780 be a, a year of intimacy with God. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I, 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 I owe my entire life and, uh, to, 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 to what the Jews have done with giving us this holy Torah. Yeah. I mean, if they had not laid their lives down with, with all that Hitler did in Nazi Germany, and they still, um, they still preserved the Torah. And I believe because of their sacrifice, we as Christians are recipients of the Holy Torah today. Amen? Because yeah. we cannot understand the Word of God, we cannot understand the New Testament without, without the rabbis without the rabbinic commentaries, without the Rashi, without the Sephorna, without all the tremendous rabbis that have been writing throughout the generations. Amen? Amen? And we cannot even understand the New Testament without understanding the depths of the rabbinic commentaries. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus longs for His glory to dwell among you. Amen? We as Christians believe that God is Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And tonight we are going to go deeper into the temple. We're, we're going to go into the inner altar of our souls. And just as the temple has chambers, your soul also has chambers. Amen? And you are called to experience the Holy Spirit in every chamber. Some of us, because of our sin, because of our hardness, just because of our lack of hunger, we've distanced the Holy Spirit from, from our temples and we just let him be in the, in the recesses of our, soul, of our bodies, and, and, we, and we never experience him. But I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to, to encompass your entire being. And Holy Spirit, I invite you to take over all of us tonight, that we, that we tonight will become your personal possession, in Jesus' holy name. Amen? Because God longs even more than you desire it. He desires that his glory dwells among you. And his glory is his presence, in Hebrew, the word for glory is Shekinah. Shekinah. So let's say, say that together. Shekinah. Shekinah. Now, in Leviticus 8, verse 28, Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering as an ordination offering, a pleasing odor, an offering of fire to the Lord. So what Moses took was the incense. And the inner altar stood in the tabernacle, it stood in a place where the mundane could not exist. Mm -hmm. Incense offerings were made in the inner court of the tabernacle. The Hebrew word for incense, incense is ketoret. Can you say it with me? Ketoret. ketoret. And it can t in the word ketoret is another Hebrew word, and that's the word ketera. Can you say that? Ketera? So in the word incense, ketoret, is another word, ketera, and the word ketera means bond. So you see how articulate the Hebrew language is? The biblical Hebrew is teaching us that incense is connected to bond. Not 007, but bonding with God, bonding into God's presence. And when you experience the inner court of your soul, you are going to experience a bonding with God. The inner altar of your soul will intensify your bond with the Lord. 
And God's presence will only dwell in you to the degree that you perceive it and treasure it. You remember in script, the New Testament the scriptures say, the Gospels say, do not cast pearl before swine. You know what that means? You, don't, you do not cast that which is holy among those that are not ready to, among those who are not ready to receive it. So the holy things of God, especially the inner altar and the incense that ascends into His presence, that inner bond that takes place, you will experience that inner bond, that glory, only to the, to the degree that you perceive it and treasure it. Mm -hmm. See, how much of the Holy Spirit do you long for? How much of Him do you want? How much of you do you want the Holy Spirit to have? Not the other way around. You know, many of us say, I want more of God, I want more of God. And our prayer should be reversed, and we should be saying, Lord, I want you to have more of me, have more of me. Amen? So I encourage all of you to really treasure the presence of God. Treasure intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit of God calls you, especially when you feel those promptings, when you know the Lord is calling you into prayer, don't resist those promptings and those leadings of the Holy Spirit. Because the more you resist Him, the more faint His glory is going to be to you. So every time He calls you, have you, any of you experienced that coming, calling the Lord, when the Lord is saying, Lord, I want you to come into prayer right now? Have, you, have any of you experienced that? Yeah. Amen. I'm glad, I, I, I'm glad you, most of you have. And if you haven't, you're going to experience that. Because God is no respecter of persons. Just make yourself available to Him. And there are going to be times where He's going to call you in a prayer. Sometimes He's going to call you just because He wants you to be with Him. Mm. Remember tonight, my teaching is not focused on destiny per se. But my focus tonight is that you become His possession. That you really have an encounter with Him. Even more than you desire ministry, even more than you desire God to use you, even more than you desire to do God, more than you desire God to do great things for you, is I want you to really enter into fellowship with Him. Amen. Because our fellowship is with the God. Is our fellowship is with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there's so much humility in the Trinity. The God the, our God the Father always glorifies the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. The Holy Spirit always magnifies the Father. And the Spirit never speaks about Himself. He only speaks about Jesus and magnifies Jesus. Amen? And even as we speak about Jesus tonight, the Spirit of God is being lifted up. Amen? And the Spirit of God is moving in this room. Amen. And there's so much humility in the Godhead how much more so should there be humility among all of us? Amen? Amen? Because the more love, the more humility, the more connectedness there is between all of us, the greater the presence of God is going to be in this room. Amen? Amen. Amen? So tonight, the teaching is glory connection. Part two is the inner court of your soul. And this, the sacrifice that Moses made, the offering of the incense, alludes to the transformation of that will take place in your life when you offer yourselves to God in order to draw closer to Him. The Apostle Paul describes this intimacy. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The RSV translation says, which is your spiritual worship. So when you offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice, not a dead body, but a living body, you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Which is your spiritual worship? So don't let, let's, let none of us forsake spiritual worship. Because by offering our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, we are worshiping God. Amen? Amen? Then verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We all need to experience transformation and renewal in our mind, don't we? You know, how, I mean, how horrible is it if, we're, if our mind, our thinking is the same way it was 15, 20 years ago? We want to go from glory to glory, don't we? We want transformation to take place in our minds. Amen? Amen? And, what, and when this transformation takes place, then you may prove what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen? Amen. 
That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now, do you want to learn another Hebrew word? Yes. It's the word korban. Can you say it with me? Korban. Korban means drawing closer. So whenever the Israelites, whenever the Levites, whenever the priests offered sacrifices to God, the purpose of the sacrifice was to draw closer to God. The purpose of the Lamb, the purpose of the Lamb of God, Christ Jesus being crucified on the cross, was to be a sacrifice, was to be a korban that we may draw closer to God. Do you desire to draw closer to God? Yes. And you know, in the Hebrew Scriptures, we see the sacrifices taking place, don't we? We see all kinds of animal sacrifices taking place. The slaughter of the animal. And remember, this is, for us Christians, all this was fulfilled through Christ Jesus. Amen? Yeah. So the slaughter that took, and Christians and non-Christians alike, the slaughter that took place represents how we renounce our evil ways or our unsanctified orientation towards life. So even the blood sacrifice, the slaughter that, that takes place, even the flogging that Jesus experienced with, with, the, um, with the whips, with the cl broken clay pieces at the end, and, and how every time he was, he, he was hit with those whips, it tore, it tore part of, uh, his flesh off his body. And that, that represents that we are to renounce our evil ways. And that even our unsanctified ways of thinking, even our unsanctified ways of, of, of seeing life, and even every perverse way of thinking or acting, is, is we renounce those evil ways. Amen? You know, we all know the obvious things of, um, of evil ways. Right? Sexual immorality of every kind. Every kind of form of fornication. I, 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 idolatry. Murder. But you know what? Even certain cultures have their own unsanctified orientation. There are cultures on the, in the earth, even to this day, where a daughter-in-law becomes the property of her in-laws. That happens in the earth today. So that is an unsanctified way of treating a person. Right? I, I hope you all agree with that. Yes. At least I do expect that in this class. And, and, and all human life is valuable. Amen? Even the lives of the unborn children are valuable. Amen? Yeah. The lives of the elderly are valuable. Yeah. So, and there are certain cultures, and even today in the earth, where uh, euthanasia is accepted. Or taking the lives of unborn, even, a, in, even to a day before the, the, the due date, is acceptable. See, these are unsanctified ways of thinking. And these, the, 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 this, this orientation needs to be renounced. So that's, the, that's what the slaughter represents. Now, the priest, would, the priest would also sprinkle the blood of the animals on the altar. Guess what? Jesus' blood was sprinkled as well. And even when Jesus, after he was crucified and he died, the soldier took a sword and pierced his side. And what came out? Water and blood. The sprinkling of the blood on the altar symbolizes how we change our focus from worldly thinking to holiness. So, we, the whole purpose of the altar is to draw closer to God, to become intimate with God. You know, we often plead the blood of Jesus, but we only plead the blood of Jesus in terms of healing, in terms of deliverance, in terms of forgiveness, in terms of, uh, um, you know, of, of, of salvation. But you know what? We also need to apply the world, the, not the world, we need to apply the blood of Jesus so that we can change our way of thinking and change our focus to holiness. Amen? Yeah. To become kadosh, to become separate. But you know what? So we slaughter the animal, we sprinkle the blood, the sacrifice is not over yet. Guess what happens next? Placing the fat of the slaughtered animal on the altar. You know, we often teach that it, uh, consuming the fat is bad, bad, but it's not here. Placing the fat of the slaughtered animal on the altar symbolizes how we can change our sense of delight from worldliness to godliness. Yeah. See, God should be your delight. The world should not be your delight. I forget the exact miracle that took place, but one, in one of Catherine Kuhlman's meetings, and I don't remember if I heard this from, from Dr. Crow or if I read it in one of Catherine Kuhlman's books, but, but she describes one of her services 
where um, there, 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 was, there was a couple, a husband and a wife, and the husband was healed, and he, even when he got up, he, he, got up, he got up from being slain in the spirit, and, and, he, and he, was, he was cussing. And Catherine Kuhlman asked him if he, wanted, if he wanted to be delivered of something. And you know what he said? He said, no, he loves his sin too much. Wow. And you know, we, 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 cannot, we laugh at that. It is, it is a little bit funny. But you know what? There are areas in our lives that we, don't, we just don't want to renounce. There are things that we just enjoy too much. If you don't struggle with that in any area, please see me after the service. Yeah. But there may be certain things in your life that you know this, you know it's not good for you, but you, but you just enjoy it too much. It, it, it might be that gossip that you just enjoy too much. Whatever it may be, you know it's wrong, and God, the Holy Spirit convicts you of it all the time, but you're, but you're not willing to let it go because you enjoy it too much. You know what? That is what placing the fat of the slaughtered animal on the altar symbolizes. Because sometimes... We're not, be, be, we're not ready to give up our bondage. We like the area of bondage too much. And in those areas, we need to learn how to allow God to become our delight. Yeah. Right? You know, one thing about any diet that any of you may go on, part of being on a diet is learning new habits in the way you handle your food. You know, for example, um, are you eating, I mean, you know, what reasons are you eating the things that you eat? And sometimes you, you need to change what you like. You may be like too much. You may you may like sweets too much, but you need to learn how to dislike the sweets more and like things that are, you don't like so much more, like vegetables, right? And it's not easy to do. It it, it, it takes time to change to what you, your lifestyle and change your likes and dislikes. And the same thing goes with sin. I mean, I wish that as soon as I said, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I wish all of my sinful ways would go away. And many of them do go away immediately, but there are some that you struggle with for a lifetime. Amen? So we, we must allow the Spirit of God to deal with our stuff. For some of us, it may be you just have this issue where you always have to get the last word in. And you're not willing to let go of your stubbornness. And you know what? You need to, and, and this may hurt a few of you, but we need to learn how to let go of that stubbornness. Sometimes we always have to, we all, must always get the last word in. But sometimes we need to allow the Spirit of God to deal with that as well and know when we should keep silent. Some of us fight every single battle. We don't let it go until we get our way. And you may need to learn how to only fight the battles that God wants you to fight. Amen? And we, we, need, to, we need to place ourselves on the altar tonight. And if you're saying, ouch, I'm saying, ouch, right along with you. Lord, we lay our lives on the altar tonight. If you're willing, please pray this prayer with me because I'll never force anyone to pray this prayer with me. But Lord, I ask you to help us renounce our evil ways. And Lord, we lay ourselves down on the altar this evening. And Lord, we, just, we worship you tonight and we offer you our bodies as a living sacrifice. And God, I ask you to help, help, help us to allow you to become our delight. Let us, not de let us not delight in the things of the world, but let our delight be in you. I'm not saying you can't enjoy your vacation, your cruises. You know, I, I encourage you to enjoy all that stuff. But what I encourage, but don't allow sin to rule over you. Amen? And don't forsake for the fellowship with the brethren. We all need that fellowship. There are so many that forsake the assembly of one another. But you know what? You can't walk, you cannot live the Christian life as loners. We need each other. Amen? Amen. So God, and allow God to be your delight. Burning the animal on the altar symbolizes the consumption of our unholy and worldly ways. Now, we have just come, we're still in the Hebrew month of Tishri. Tishri is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. The first day of Tishri was known, is known as Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. It's the Hebrew New Year. Amen? On Rosh Hashanah, all of creation passes passes before God in judgment. It's judgment day. It's a day of remembrance. And then we're given 10 days of repent, an additional 10 days of repentance. And on the 10th day of Tishri is known as the Day of Atonement, also called Yom Kippur. It's the holiest day of the entire year, and on that day, your destiny is sealed for the entire year. Because on Rosh Hashanah, the Hebrew year increments from 5779 to 5780. Amen? Amen? That means it's been 5,780 years 
since the creation of Adam and Eve. So on Rosh Hashanah, Adam and Eve were created. On a Rosh Hashanah, prior to that, the universe was created. The earth was created. The heavens were created, all on Rosh Hashanahs. Joseph came out of prison on a Rosh Hashanah. Samuel was conceived in the womb of Hannah on a Rosh Hashanah. Isaac was consumed, not consumed, was conceived in the womb of Sarah on a Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah has been a, a time of countless miracles throughout history. Amen? Amen. So, so the tenth day of Tishri, our destinies are sealed. In the tenth day of Tishri, Yom Kippur, is the only day of the year in which Satan is not permitted to accuse their brethren. Then we count another five days, and that's what day? The 15th day of Tishri. So from Tishri 15 to Tishri 21 is seven days of the Feast of Sukkot. Can you say Sukkot? Sukkot. Or Feast of Tabernacles? And then on Sunday, just this past Sunday, Sunday night began the eighth day of that feast, and that day is called Shemini Atzeret. Can you say it with me? Shemini Atzeret. It's the eighth day of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. It takes place on the 25th day of the seventh month of Tishri. And this feast celebrates the intensity in which we can experience the Lord's presence. Let me give you another example. Do you remember when God came down from Mount Sinai with the first set of ten tablets? And what did he find the Israelites doing? Right? They were worshiping the golden calf. So when Moses heard them in the camp and he, he, he knew they were sinning, what did Moses do? He cast the two tablets of stones down the ground intentionally. They shattered into thousands of pieces. And do you know why he broke the, ten ta- why he broke the commandments? It wasn't accidental, it was intentional. Yeah, he was upset, and that's the way I, I read it. But even more so, it was a form of intercession. See, when, you, we, when we read the text, especially in our English Bibles, it looks like Moses is just an angry man that's never happy. That's not the case at all. Moses has an intense love for God, and he has an intense love for Israel. And the reason why he cast the tablets of stone down was for the same reason why Jonah fled from the presence of God. See, Jonah is one of my favorite prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures. And, I, and I'll explain to you in, why in just a moment. The reason... The Ten Commandments that Moses brought down were the marriage contract between God and Israel. And guess what? When the Israelites, not not all the Israelites, but many of the Israelites were worshiping the golden calf. And the rabbis tell us that none of the women were participating, it was just the men. And when they were participating in this horrible sin, Moses broke the Ten Commandments because... He thought if he broke the commandments, God would lessen the punishment. Because they were breaking the marriage contract. They were committing adultery and idolatry at the same time against God. So, but in the marriage contract was broken by Moses, so the Israelites would not be guilty of committing idolatry and adultery. Make sense? He did it because he loved Israel so much. And so he, Moses came down from Mount Sinai on the 17th day of Tammuz. The 17th day of the fourth month. And then on the first day of the fifth month, which is the first day of Alal. Don't worry if you don't remember this. This will be in the recording. On the first day of Alal, Moses went back up to Mount Sinai. And he, and he was interceding for Israel from Elul 1 all the way through Tishri 10 for 40 days. And you know what took place when they sinned with the golden calf? I want you to remember something. When the Israelites left Egypt, what were they led by? Cloud, cloud right? They were led by seven clouds of God's glory. A cloud of, uh, and I say this all the time, a cloud, one cloud to lead them, a cloud above, a cloud beneath, a cloud on the left, a cloud on the right, a cloud on the back, a cloud on the front. A total of seven clouds. When they sinned with the golden calf, God removed the miracle of the seven clouds of His glory, being their protection. So, after 
Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time, on the, which he returned on the eleventh day of Tishri, one day after Yom Kippur, right? And when he returned on the eleventh, he commanded the Israelites to begin gathering material for the building of the tabernacle for three days, 12, 13, and 14th day of Tishri. Then on the 15th day of Tishri, the first day of the Feast of, Feast of Tabernacles, they began to build the tabernacle. And when they began to build, the seven clouds of God's glory returned back to Israel. Isn't that glorious? Amen. So this feast celebrates and inaugurates the return of God's glory to His people. That is the, one of the major themes of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's not just dwelling in booths for seven days. It's, it, it's commemorating and experiencing the return of God's glory into your lives as well. Because during this season, during this feast day, during this eighth, feast, eighth day of the of Feast of Tabernacles, we can experience the intensity of God's glory at levels you've never known before. And guess what? You're going to come to this high point, and your goal for the rest of the year is to retain that intimacy with God right. and even take it to even higher heights. Amen? Because yeah. we want to become more intimate with God. You're going to find yourself, when you become so intimate with God, that it, you'll walk into a place, it could even be in a church, where there's ungodly activity taking place. Or the, the level of kadosh, of holiness, is not, is not that strong, that you can feel the Holy Spirit is grieved, and you will step out of those places where the Spirit of God is being grieved. Or you may be teaching, you may be preaching, you may be interceding, whatever you're doing, and when you sense that the Spirit, that the anointing is not as strong, you know that something needs to change. Amen? Because we need to learn how to follow the leading, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to be our leader, to be our strength. Allow Him to be intimate with us. Allow yourselves to experience Him. I mean, there are times that you're just going to sense that His glory is so strong if you do this. But if you divert and do something else, His presence diminishes. It's not that His presence has diminished. It just means that you've walked away from what He wants you to do at that very moment. And so we must learn how to depend on the Holy Spirit for everything. <coughs> You know, there are times, even in my secular work life, where I go, Lord, how do I do this? Lord, how do I solve this problem? And I'll, I'll begin seeking the Lord. And, and, and I, I try to do one thing, and I just feel a block. And my habit is, if it doesn't work the first time, I'll do it wrong ten more times. It's like banging your head on the wall until you get different results. But you know what? That's the definition, the definition of insanity. We need to learn how, how to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. If I'm seeking God in a situation, I'll often take my Bible and just ask the Holy Spirit, let my eyes fall upon the word that you have for me in a situation. And often my eyes will fall upon a scripture that relates to my situation. You know how I, how I knew I was to marry Bhavna? When, after meeting her for about 10 minutes? It was after she, when she left, and I went to my room and I opened the scriptures. Every scripture my eyes set on was, was about marriage. Rebecca with Isaac. Um, it, uh, it was just uh, Jacob and, and, and Rachel. It was just absolutely phenomenal the way God was speaking to me. I go, God, you can't be speaking to me to get married. I, I, we've only talked for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's, what? that's how God dealt with me in terms of my marriage. Oh. Amen? Yes. And three weeks later, I was married. I don't... I, and I mean, that was totally the, the leading of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit, amen? And I encourage you all, don't, don't limit God to any less. Allow Him to lead you into all truth. You know, I have never made a job change, a career change, a, a, not even a, a degree selection, without seeking God's presence first. I'm telling you, I, I, I remember before I entered the college, before I accepted one of the college offers, I spent days praying and seeking God for, for His will for my life. And then after finishing school and getting the, my first few job offers, I was begging the Lord, Lord, show me what you want me to do. And even in terms of ministry, 
Uh, the Lord was telling me to leave one place and come uh, and to serve in this house fully, and I sought the Lord in that area too, because I, I have not made any major decision in life without seeking His presence first. Mm-hmm. And even the job that I took, in, a job offer I took back in January, I did not take it without prayer and fasting and and, and, and counsel with Bhavna and others. But I really needed to know that God's leading, Amen. To know the Lord's leading in my life, and I encourage all of you to depend upon God for everything. <clears throat> And sometimes God doesn't make your path completely clear right away. He just wants you to trust Him and know that He's leading you. Amen? Amen. Just know that He's leading you. And I remember when it came to marrying Bhavna, on a Friday, I felt the peace of God. And it was a Friday afternoon, I was talking to Bhavna on the phone. And, I mean, you can just imagine how kind Bhavna was on the phone. And, um... And that was a Friday, and then Monday, the, the wedding was scheduled, just two, a couple days afterward, the, thir- the third day. And I remember even on the weekend, I was going, did I make the right choice? We just met just a couple weeks ago. But you know what? It, this was completely God directing me. He was completely in this, and this was God's perfect will for her life and for my life as well. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And I'm telling you, it completely lines up with, with the way God has led us. Yeah. Now, am I going to say that life has been completely beautiful since? Between Bob and I, it has been beautiful. But you know what? We have gone through the most fiery trials of our lives in the last 18 years of our marriage. Mm-hmm. Now, Sunday is a very special day, but I don't think Bob knows what it is. Mm-hmm. So, this feast, so what we want to experience is the fullness of God's presence in our lives. The fullness of Him leading us. And I, I want to give each and every one of you a test this week. And don't worry, Bhavna always reminds me of the test I give you, because she gives me the same test as well. <laughs> the test is to be joyful no matter what takes place. No matter what takes place this next week, I encourage you all to be joyful regardless of your circumstance. Right? And allow yourselves to, to experience the intensity of God's presence. You know, I encourage many of you to start taking books on prayer and start reading them. If you want some suggestions, I would suggest Interior Castle, but that, that one's probably too difficult of a read. But I do recommend that all of you read Reese Howe, Intercessor. Now I'm going to ask you a question, because this Saturday is Consecration Day for Breath of the Spirit Ministries. Why do you serve God? Why do you study God's Word? Do you serve God out of a sense of passive obligation? Before you answer the question, I want you to hear it one more time. Do you study God's Word or do you serve God out of a sense of passive obligation? I'm going to say I'm guilty of that over and over again. I remember, how many of you have seen those one-year study Bibles in the Christian bookstores? Yeah. Or even at Barnes & Noble? Or on Amazon? And you know, those are beautiful, those are beautiful Bibles, and it can, it can help you become disciplined. But, but, but you know, what, you know what, the, um, what the pitfall is? The pitfall is you begin studying God's Word out of, out, of, out of a sense of passive obligation, and not because you want to know Him and love Him more. Amen? I'm telling you, 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 you could get on, you, you could, even when you study God's word, allow yourselves to fall more in love with God. And allow the Holy Spirit to become your teacher. Allow Him to teach you. And He will lead you into all truth. But don't sit down and, 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 and fast read the book of Leviticus just, just so you can check a box saying you finished that book during the 12 year, 12 month period. And if I may, Shock a few of you. Leviticus is one of the most is one of the most exciting books in the entire Bible. Because it's the meat of God's Torah. The rabbis describe it as the meat in a sandwich. Exodus and sorry, Genesis and Exodus are like the uh, uh, one side of the, it's like one slice of the bread. Numbers and Deuteronomy are the other the other slice of bread, and Leviticus is the meat in the middle. Because Leviticus teaches you how to offer yourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Because you learn how to become a living sacrifice. 
So we don't want to serve God with a sense of obligation. We want to serve God because we love Him. We want to read His Word because we love Him. Amen? Yes, amen. See, you can spend an entire month reading Genesis out of obligation, or you can spend an, a day reading Genesis and just completely fall in love with God through the entire process. Where you can stay all night long, long reading God's Word. Amen? Also, I want to share one other thing with you. Is Remember I, sh I told you Jonah was one of my favorite prophets as well? Do you know why Jonah ran away from the presence of God? The reason why Jonah ran away was because he loved Israel too much. God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach repentance. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Jonah knew in about 150 years or so, or I forget, in a certain number of years, Assyria was going to take the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. Because God was going to bring judgment upon the northern ten tribes because of, because of sin. And Nineveh was going to be the instrument to take the Israelites into captivity. So that was the reason why Jonah did not want to preach repentance to Nineveh. Because he would rather see Nineveh destroyed than see Israel destroyed. And the reason why we don't see God rebuking Jonah, and, and the reason why God has a book in the Bible named after Jonah, was to honor Jonah, because Jonah loved Israel so much. He loved God's people so much that he was even willing to put his own life on the line for the sake of God's people. And that's exactly what Moses did as well. He said, blot my name out of the book, if you're going to wipe out the Israelites. And even St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was willing to give up his own salvation for the sake of his Jewish brethren. You, you see the love these prophets have for God and for Israel. Amen? Amen? See, God will never forsake Israel. And even though the Western world is becoming so anti-Semitic, we must not lo lose our love for Israel. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was conceived, born, raised, crucified, and rose from the dead being Jewish, and he's still Jewish today. Amen? Yeah. So you cannot extract the Jewishness out of our Messiah. You know, we kind of joke on it when I say that, but, you know, but we've all done it uh, subconsciously. So tonight, what I'm inviting you all to do is that you serve God not out of passive obligation, but you serve God because you want to. Uh, if you want to, tell your neighbor... Uh, I'm serving God because I want to. It, it's, it's, not out of, it's not out of passive obligation. It's because I want to. And I want to be intimate with Him. You know, think about your kids, your grandchildren. Do you want your grandkids to be with you just because their parents told them to be? No, you want them to be with you because they want to be with you. You know, Bob and I get no greater joy than when our nephew picks up the phone and calls us on FaceTime by himself. Because we want him to want to be with us, amen? Not, not to force him, but we want him to enjoy us as much as we enjoy him. And there's no one cute in the world than, than little Kavi. Amen? <laughs> and every grandparent and uncle and aunt are going to say that, right? <laughs> So what I, the, the grace, the anointing of this period, especially during the Feast of Tabernacles, and especially on this eighth day of Shemini Atzeret, which occurred on Sunday night through Monday, is we want, to, we want to merit closeness and intimacy with God. And we don't want to get caught up in the sins of the past, but we want to move forward in God. We want to grow. We want our future to be better than our past. We don't want to carry the baggage of last year into this current year, but we, we, we want to serve God with greater fervency than ever before. We want to love Him. We want to please Him. We want to enjoy each other more than ever before. Amen? We want our, we want our ministries to be better than ever before. And you notice tonight, I did, not, I did not emphasize your ministries, even though most of the time I emphasize your ministries. And I'm not diminishing your ministries, but I want you, don't just go for the desserts. I want you to, to partake of the main meal. And the main meal is to be in fellowship with God. To be intimate with Him. To fellowship with Him. 
When's the last time when you just blocked out all distractions and it was just you and the Lord? You and the Lord and, and, and the Word. Maybe worship too if, 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 if needed. But just to be alone with God without your cell phone, without anything. For me, it's kind of hard because I'm surrounded by devices all the time. But there are times where I, I just need to disconnect from IoT stuff, just disconnect from stuff and connect with Him. Amen? Amen. You know, over the last few years, and we, I never really planned it to be this way. It just happened this way. It was divine providence. But every year around G December or January, we, uh, we, we end up in India. And during those two to three weeks, I, I'm, I'm not that connected with my devices. But you know what? That's when God pours the most revelation into me so I, so I can write the books that He wants me to write. And, and it just and it, it just and it just seems to pour it just seems to pour out of me because I'm more open to receiving from God. Yeah. And I want all of you to allow God to be that to you, just to connect with Him. You know, if you look at our uh, Bob and I, my post on, on social media, we're often by the ocean because that's the place where I need to be to connect with the Lord. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time just staring through the ocean and allowing God to speak because it's a time where. I disconnect from other things, and it's like a Shabbat for me, where, where Bob and I connect with, with the Lord. Amen? So I want all of you to allow that time. Ministry service is very important, and, it, and it's very fulfilling. But don't let ministerial service replace your relationship with God. Amen? Because your relationship with God is foremost. Yeah. And if you find yourself doing so many works, you need to examine yourself and, and ask the question, have I lost my first love? Because if you serve God 24, 20 hours a day and you have no, intim no, intim no intimacy with God, guess what? You're going to burn out very quickly. Because always put fellowship with God above everything else. Amen? Now, as I conclude here, I want to share with you five levels of the soul. Do you want to hear that tonight? Yeah. yeah. All right. So in Genesis 2, 7, we read, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, be a living being. The lowest level of your soul is, is nefesh. Can you say nefesh? nefesh? And the word nefesh comes from the root word nafash, which means to rest. So the, the, the word nefesh is the, is the lowest extremity of our soul which completely identifies with our human body. Deuteronomy 12, 23 says, the blood is in the soul, right? It's saying the blood is in the nefesh. The, the closest word that I can think about in our Christian understanding is the flesh. So when you say that you're not in the flesh, it means you're not in the nefesh. Because in the, the nefesh level of your soul, is your tendency to war, is towards sin. So when, when God says to crucify the flesh, we're crucifying the part of our, our soul which is called the nefesh. Then the next level of the soul is called the ruach. Can you say ruach? Ruach, ruach is the word that we translate as spirit. See, in, in Jewish terminology, terminology, there are five levels of the soul. In our Christian terminology, we'll use the word soul sometimes to refer to, it can mean any one of these five, it depends on the context. So the word ruach is often translated as the word spirit, and it's, it connotates the wind, the air, or direction. The ruach represents your character, your ability to choose between right and wrong, your ability to make decisions, and to be held accountable for the choices that you make. So your intellect is in your ruach. It's in the ruach part of your soul. Your flesh relates to the nefesh. The next level of the soul is called the neshama. Neshama means breath. Can you say breath? breath. So you remember what we read in Genesis that God breathed into, breathed into Adam and he became a living soul? What God breathed into him, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. What he breathed into him was the neshama. 
And I believe when you become born again, it's the neshama that comes to life. Because when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he breathed his divine soul into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. The next two levels I'm not going to talk about tonight. But I just want, I think I've given you a lot to chew on here. But I just want you to focus on those, on those bottom three levels. Amen? The nefesh, the ruach, and the neshama. Can you say it with me? The nefesh equals flesh. The next level is the, the ruach, the spirit. And the third level is the neshama, the breath of life. Amen? I don't think the Lord wants me to talk about the four and five tonight. That's why I'm not going to go there. And as, I, as for my final conclusion, there are some things in your life that you just need to leave on the altar. Amen? There, there are situations in life that you just cannot fix. You know, you, do, you, do, do you remember how horribly Absalom treated David, his father? Not only did he overtake David's kingdom, he dethroned his father David. His, Dave, his father had to go into exile. And Absalom did the most cruel thing to his father. The cruelest thing, the grossest thing you could ever imagine. He shamed his father David in front of all of Israel. You know what he did? 2 Samuel 16, 22. So they pitched a tent for Absalom upon the roof. This is the roof of the palace. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. He shamed his father by having relations with all of his father's concubines. Just the most horrifying sin took place. And he did this to bring the most disgrace that he could to his father. And, as, and no matter how much David interceded and prayed for Absalom, Absalom was lost. And Absalom... Hung him, uh, you know, he, he, he basically hung himself. There are some things in, in our lives that we cannot carry into this new year. We need to just leave it on the altar. The, the betrayals that may have taken place, family members that have just treated you horribly, things that have just been so horrible in your life, you just can't take that baggage. You cannot even dwell on that baggage from the previous year. You need to leave it on the altar and move forward. I believe all, and I believe the Spirit of God is speaking to all of you. I know this sounds like a very gross scripture to use, but it's the Word of God, so I'm, I, I can use it. Amen. Because all all scripture is profitable for doctrine and reproof. Amen. Yes. And so, what I want to bring out here is there's certain things that you can't take with you to your next to your, to your into the year of five seven eight zero. So just leave it on the altar, and, and through it all, just empty your soul, empty yourself on the, on, on God's altar. And just empty yourself to Him. Pour yourself out to Him. Don't stuff your issues. Learn how to empty yourself and pour your issues out before God. You know, uh, Bob and I just went through a trial, and we're still actually still living this trial, is that the Psalms came more to life. They came to life in, our, in us more than ever before. It's like when we, were, when we were reading the Psalms, it's like God, the Holy Spirit was praying through us and praying our anguish through us. And he was emptying us of, of, of all that baggage. Amen. Now I'm telling you, it's a beautiful thing when, when, when God cleanses your soul. Yeah. And, you, and he lifts those burdens away from you. Because there's some burdens that are not mine to carry. Yeah. There are some situations I cannot fix. They're done. They're finished. There's no reparation. I just need to lay, leave it on the altar and not pick it back up again. But just keep moving forward in God. Because God has great things in store for each and every one of you. Amen. Because God, God is going to pour His revelation into you. God's going to pour His Spirit into you. You are going to walk in the realm of the Spirit in tremendous ways. You are going to perform great exploits for God. Some of you may write books, you may speak, you may do different things in the earth. But allow God to use you, amen? And allow your voice to be heard. Don't let, don't let the devil shut you up. Allow God to make a platform for you because your gift will make room for you. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Hallelujah.